Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the second episode of The Power of Tech Education. I'm Daniel Newman, founding partner, principal analyst at Futurum Research, CEO of the Futurum Group, joined once again by my friend, Eric Fusilero with Splunk to talk a little bit about technology, education, and some of the intersections that are going on in how we're going to keep our workforce capable, competent, and driving important innovation that will change the future, not just of tech, but of businesses in every industry. Eric, how are you doing? Welcome back. I'm great. Thanks for having me back. So in this episode, we're going to talk a little bit more about your company, Splunk, but then, of course, I'm going to bring a bit of an outside perspective across the industry. We're going to talk about championing careers in IT and cybersecurity. I imagine for you, you know, as the enablement guy, right, as you like to say, uh, this is a big part of how you judge your success is the people that you're sort of helping enable, the people that go through trainings and, and the things that you're facilitating as an enabler. Um, you're, you're looking to see those stars rise. I think we ended the last episode talking yeah. about that, how good yeah. it feels when people yeah. Uh, move up. But uh, yeah, so how's that going for you? You know, I think it's going well. It's always a continuously improved journey, if you will. Um, but, you know, when we when we look at some of the surveys and reports of, you know, folks who have learned Splunk, right? And so we did a, we do a, this annual global Splunk career survey report, um, which tells us a lot about th that question, Daniel, right? Which is, is it making a difference? Is it benefiting them? Are they seeing um, the opportunity as a result, right? And so you know, what that report is showing us is we're heading in the right direction. There's always more work to do, but it's but skilling up on Splunk is leaving them with feelings of increased, let's say, job satisfaction, right? The opportunity to add value to their company, job security, job mobility, especially in sort of the the turbulent world that we live in today, as an example, and then career advance advancement. And of course, sort of compensation, but you know the benefits of learning Splunk are just giving them a better sense of well-being, which, to be honest, makes me proud. Yeah, I think that should. I mean, in your role, like you said, you came from the tech background, moving into this enablement background, you got to be able to measure and say, "Is what I'm doing working?" And so, you know, as a CEO and, and leading a team of, of analysts, my proud moments are always when you see the, you know, the when the, the, the students become the teachers, when the analysts in our firm become more competent, more capable, more prolific than me. And I said, you know, my company could benefit a ton when they're all better than me. Yeah. Um, sometimes putting your ego aside is the hardest thing to do though when you're, when you're running a group, running a team. And there's a whole other side of this conversation, by the way, related to leadership itself, you know, and what a leader needs to do, Eric, to actually be a better enabler. Because a lot of leaders, like, I don't want my team to get better than me. But, you know, I always use the sales example is the best sales managers are never the best salespeople. And I think that's one of those really simple to understand is the reason they became sales managers is because they're better at motivating people that actually are great salespeople. And oftentimes they're the ones that were, you know, average best managers of baseball teams were never the best baseball players, but they tended to understand the game really well and really knew how to drive and get performance out of those star athletes. Yeah. I want to get a little bit more granular here, though, because I like all the high level stuff. It's very ephemeral to me and that's i love i love playing at that uh, at that altitude eric but I, I think for our audience here i also want to get a little bit more specific uh -huh. so you know with an education like splunk it's very prescriptive meaning companies have very specific goals as it relates to whether it's you know uh it ops or sec ops you know and these are the two areas that you guys uh -huh. really are a leader in my opinion as an analyst but how do you quantify the value of the Splunk education ecosystem? Um, I know there's a lot of jobs for Splunk. You could search it. But like, how do you really quantify that someone going through that process will uh, have a better outcome? Yeah, I mean, how we look at it from a company perspective is really it starts with is you know, is the company who is who has invested in our technology, invested in our services, are they successful? And I realize that that is a multi-dimensional answer, right? Success could be just sort of growth of their own business. It could be, you know, are they using the the investment? Because there's nothing worse than you know, like in like in everyday world, you buy something and sort of sits on the shelf. Well, that's a wasted investment. Um, and then 
are they continually solve problems that they expected to achieve that someone sold them on, right? There's no, nothing worse than someone selling you on a vision, helping you imagine the, 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 the possible, and then you end up going, really, did I get that kind of thing? And so looking at education very specifically is looking at that from the perspective of one, yes, someone sold you on the vision, but are you now able to put it into practice? Are you now able to sort of make it work for you, for your company, for the customers that you serve, for the purpose that you set out to achieve as an example, right? And so that's just, you know, at a high level view, sort of some of the things that we're doing. And again, this sits across whether you're trying to use Splunk from an analytics perspective, um, from a security perspective, from an observability perspective, or just the combination of all, which we know um, is something that more and more companies are realizing they need because, you um, keeping their environments, their systems safe and performant is critical to them, especially in a world where, you know, there are no more really analog experiences, they're all digital, right? And so in a digital world, let's make sure that those systems are performant and safe. Wait, no analog transformation. <laughs> I'm not saying no analog, but it's increasingly sort of digital in terms of those experiences. I think analog still occurs. Right, but I, I get kidding. your point. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, I did see though that there is this uh, very strong gravity towards humans doing things in person, which is going to be an interesting uh, long-term impact on sort of training and the the velocity and veracity of training. Yeah, because part of the you know we always love to talk about experiences, Eric, but part of it is you know, training, obviously sitting in, you know, my daughter's studying for SATs right now. It's like, do we send her to a class where she sits in a room and gets, or do you do an online self-guided or semi self-guided thing and learning styles are important, but also just that human sort of condition, Eric, is like, I want to be with people. You know, yeah. I, 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 I was told there would never be live events again during the pandemic, or then it was, we'll never do a regular live event. And then I spent like, 22 hours on the road, like 48 weeks at events. So it's like, you all lied to me. You lied to me. <laughs> Everybody actually wants to be together in person. Um, just just a, any quick thoughts on that as before I get yeah. back to talking a little more specific? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? Because I, I mean, it's, it's interesting. We have these discussions all the time, which is, is live learning go away? And it's like, no, live learning will never go away. Um, I think in some cases, there's virtual live learning that occurs, right? conversations like we're having now as an example um that didn't really wasn't available um earlier because you know the, the technology wasn't there but i think you know in this world that we live in where now you know zoom interactions wet you know webcast interactions are more prevalent because of we had to do it in covid right and that was the only way we do it like i think that changed the mindset in terms of how everything can occur um and so now we you know we need to be more purposeful and deliberate in terms of how we take advantage of that face-to-face -face time. Because, fo I mean, we've experienced this, right, which is learners will get frustrated with, hey, I didn't need to be here. Whereas before there was no other option, now there's other options. And so making sure that you leverage the collaboration, um, you know, sort of the, the creativity that's in a room that sometimes is really difficult to do or is done but in a very lengthy period of time right versus sort of just getting in a room hammering it out you know whiteboarding stuff um looking over people's shoulders on keyboards and things like that and just having a conversation face to face which is which occurs at a much more accelerated pace because you, there's not there's there's less lost in translation if i if i use that phrase yeah and i think it's ultimately i i, I use the word continual but i really do think it's a continuum you know and it's sort of you know, personality types, sociological, uh, you know, people's desires to travel versus their desires to be at home, people's feelings of safety, people's feelings of type learning skills, right? Because learning is visual and there's auditory learning and then there's experiential learning. And, and so there's a lot of factors. So we want to always kind of like boil it down, like an SAT test, like I use that as an example, is yeah. the definer of someone's uh, aptitude, but it's like, so not, because it's one of like several markers of somebody being successful. I'll never publicly reveal my SAT score, but I would say I've done a lot better in life than my SAT probably would have indicated I was going to do. Uh, and I think there's a lot of times that's the case because it depends what this, 
particular skill set, we need to ascribe to a certain type of role. So scantrons have their place, but it's not the end all and be all of whether or not you can be successful. Right, back to our regular schedule programming here. Um, from a from a standpoint of you know, I know your customers and you have a business model around people buying Splunk training, and they buy that training. That training turns into jobs and careers and opportunities and development. But Splunk as a whole has come out with some different things they're trying to do to also show more. You know, we're seeing different companies. We've seen Amazon and Microsoft. All of them are starting. But Splunk has a kind of a story too about how you plan to democratize education. Yep. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I love the term democratize because it's absolutely what we're trying to do, right? Which is, um, again, going back to our very first conversation around like, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Well, there's a skill shortage. There's a talent gap, right? And how do you address that? You got to break up a bit you know, your your current motion in terms of how you solve for that you know, ever increasing problem. And so the you know one perspective that we have is how do we make learning more frictionless yet impactful to everyone everywhere, right? And so it's sort of the democratization point that you made, right? What I mean by frictionless is, you know, when you sort of look at how learning was delivered before, you have to create more modalities for it, like we were just talking about in terms of those digital experiences. You gotta put it in context around time, right? Not everyone can take four days out of the office or off the phone or whatever to sort of sit in the classroom. Um, cost is a, is a factor, right? Which is why we've sort of now offered free learning at the same time that's also self-paced in terms of a modality. There's language challenges, right? To make sure that you're actually reaching folks, not just in the US, but across the globe where there's emerging opportunities. Um, and then the question is around access. Um, you know, we've created opportunities for folks to learn Splunk, not just by coming to us, because to be honest, not everybody knows who we are yet. Um, and so how do you sort of put learning in the water coolers of the world, as an example, so they actually find it? And so that's sort of the opportunities of the online providers, like a Coursera, Plural site, as an example, and then partners across the globe who deliver learning as a business. And so, again, in order to help more folks achieve outcomes, that's sort of the opportunity we have, which is expand the learning opportunities, make it frictionless to everyone and everywhere. Yeah, I like that. And I, and, and I do agree. Like I said, what's going to become a bit of a challenge is going to be over is, is almost in over uh, availability and choice, meaning totally. there are special skills. And that's why I said, like, people have Splunk skills. There's a very specific job opportunity. I believe we're going to talk actually a little bit more about that in, in our third episode. So yep. uh, we'll, we'll dig a little bit more into what that means. But I'm saying every kind of tech company is taking a, a different stab at this protect at this we're going to make more available and then by the way all the universities are saying like we will attract students but and so the beauty is information it's like look i got to be one of the first people to play with the new chat gpt 35 and bing and i'm asking it questions and i'm yeah. like write a good business description for my firm and you get that it's like wow that's actually really good i called the marketing team i'm like you're fired all of you but in some ways, like <laughs> It, it was a process of kind of going through and seeing a new tool, a new thing gets made available. You figure out how it could change your business. But then, you know, you do though, you see like a Galileo and it's like a design tool that can help you design like a website in like minutes um, just by describing what you're trying to do. And you go, whoa, do I need to get rid of all my developers? It's changing, you know, and it's, it's like, well, the truth is, is it's probably going to mean that what you spend to have your developers do will be up here instead of down here. That's where it should go. That's right. But having so much choice is complicated. I don't know if you've ever eaten at the Cheesecake Factory. Oh, my God. I can never decide what to eat there. The menu is too big. Right. Um, and so for uh, someone that wants to come up in tech, do I get a certain AWS? Do I get a certain Microsoft? Do I get a certain Cisco? Do I get a certain Splunk? Do I get? Yep. These are a lot of decisions to make. So figuring out how to differentiate is going to be a big key for you, but also for people to choose which path will get them there. And, yeah. and, and with that in mind, maybe – Talk about the recruitment process. This is where I'd like to end this episode is, so people are coming up, lots of search, lots of education. Everyone's, I took a LinkedIn Live on this and I do, I took this Microsoft course. Now I, I got a Splunk certain observability and I got, 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 got. How did recruiters anymore decide? It used to be, what university did you go to? What degree do you have for a technical job? That was kind of the gateway. Then it was, what company did you work for? Did you go to IBM and get there? Did you go to, to you know, 
uh, work for a big consulting firm like Bain? Like, where did you go? In this case, now they're getting 10, 20 different choices. Yeah, absolutely. Where do we land? Yeah, so, um, wow, a lot of different ways to sort of approach that question. I think, you know, to your earlier point around the fact that there's too much right too much choice absolutely right which is why i think guidance and direction is even ever more important i mean just to use your analogy around cheesecake factory like streaming channels like what do i watch i can't even find something as an example right and so i think from a learning standpoint it's the same view because there's so much out there who do i trust where do i go is at the right level etc and so to your question around you know how do how do companies qualify candidates um, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways, especially realizing that, you know, we've got on one end, you've got companies who need talent and one end, you've got academic institutions who are producing talent and you've got the sort of gap in the middle. How do you sort of cross that chasm in many cases, especially because now the academic institutions over here, it's not what it may used to be, right? You've got, you, you've got, you know, you always have your tiered schools. You now have lower tier schools who are creating two plus two programs, as an example. And you even have talent coming straight out of two year programs who are gaining their experience. And so I think one is always going to be looked at in terms of one, do they have the knowledge? And you can evaluate that based on, you know, um, do they have badges? Do they have certificates? Do they have certifications, as an example? Because that's an easy one. Daniel to always sort of measure and tag onto, and you see it in, in their social media profiles as an example. But the piece that I think is the most important is, can they apply it? And, you know, I have many conversations with many academic institutions, and the challenge is less about the technology piece, and it's more about the people piece, right? Which is, in a world, in our world today, everything is done with people. They're done in project teams. You're working collectively to solve problems. And so that's the other piece of evaluation that, that occurs in terms of one, they, do they have the technology chops, but can they apply that technology chops in a work environment with other people? Um, and then you look at it in terms of, okay, based on the problems that the company is trying to solve, do all of those elements work together and are they a good fit? Yeah, Eric, I think that's a, a really good spot for us to wrap up this episode because I think going into the final of our three parts, what I would love to do is bring in an outside view. Someone that's actually going through this, you know, you as an established person in the technology industry, leading a function, watching this all happen, me as an industry analyst that looks at the whole tech space is, is evaluating everything from the you know, the talent wars all the way to how companies differentiate through the trainings they offer. And of course, I'm always focused on the products and services, making sure that they're the best. But sometimes hearing from people who have actually made a conscious choice to take a certain education path to develop their career is the best way to truly understand how uh, efficient and effective programs like the ones we've been talking about are. So with that in mind, let's shut this one down. And let's bring everybody back for the third episode. So we hope you're enjoying this. We're going to hear from up here about how tech and education enablement are developing careers. Thanks for tuning into this episode. We'll see you back for the third real soon.